The uh, subcommittee will come to order uh, at the conclusion of opening statements yesterday. Uh, I called up H.R. 1582, and the bill was open for amendment at any point. And uh, as I said yesterday, the first we would consider would be bipartisan amendments because we knew there'd be a lot of those. Uh, are there any bipartisan amendments? Doesn't seem to be. So, are there other amendments to H.R. 1582? Mr. Chairman, uh, my amendment, uh, I have an amendment at, at the desk that uh, if, in fact, we, were, we had more, uh, well, no, 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 if we had more camaraderie, it wouldn't be a bipartisan amendment, but I do have an amendment okay. at the desk. Okay, Mr. Rush has an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk report his amendment? Amendment to H.R. 1582 offered by Mr. Rush of Illinois. Without objection, uh, the, re the reading of Mr. Rush's amendment is dispensed with, and uh, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes uh, to explain and in support of his amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, my, this is indeed a common sense amendment, uh, and it was <clears throat> uh, my amendment was based uh, on the fact that this bill has a number of fatal flaws to it. Uh, one of the biggest problems with the bill under consideration is that it provides the Secretary of Energy with unprecedented veto power over energy-related EPA rules. If the Secretary of Energy determines that the cost of an EPA rule will cause a significant adverse effect to the economy, the rule is blocked. The bill goes a step further and stacks the deck in favor of blocking EPA rules by focusing only, focusing only on the potential cost of a rule without any regard to the benefits of the self-same rule. For example, the bill says that the Secretary of Energy must examine whether an EPA rule will increase energy prices, ignoring the possibility that the rule could lower energy costs for consumers. The bill also says that the Secretary of Energy must examine whether an EPA rule would have adverse effect, effects on energy supply, ignoring the possibility that an EPA rule could have a positive impact on the, energy, on the nation's energy portfolio. But what the bill does not say is even more telling. The bill, the bill doesn't use the word benefit not even once. Most, if not all, of EPA's energy-related rules have tremendous benefits for the American people. And these benefits are measured in real life quantifying uh, 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 categories. These benefits are life savings, asthma attacks prevented, hospital visits averted. These rules cut emissions of toxic air pollutants that cause cancer and damage the brains of developing babies. But the bill is silent on these benefits. The bill provides for a DOE veto of an EPA rule based on skewed analysis. EPA reviews reviewed this legislation, and they raised some serious concern. EPA stated, and I quote, by ignoring the benefits, the draft legislation instructs policymakers to adopt an inherently biased approach that is inconsistent with the, with the fundamental principles of environmental law and would lead to flawed decision making, end of quote. This is a quote by the EPA. And Mr. Chairman, my amendment seeks to eliminate 
the same values. My amendment seeks to restore some balance to the DOE's review. With my amendment, the required analysis will have to account for the benefits of an EPA rule when determining, when, when determining the nation's economic impact. The Secretary would have to look at how the rule benefits human health and cuts health care costs by reducing dangerous air pollution, including greenhouse gas emissions. The well, Secretary will also have to look at positive impacts on energy supply and use. Will the, will the gentleman yield? Uh, look, I, I only have a few more seconds, and I want to finish this up. For a friendly uh, inquiry. I'll, uh, I'll call on the gentleman when you finish. Uh, I want to finish up, and he, he say he'll call on you in a moment. The chairman in, indicated he'll call on you as soon as I finish. The secretary will also have to look at positive impacts on energy supply and use, such as increasing energy efficiency and deployment of renewable energy. Mr. Chairman, this is common sense. I disagree with giving DOE a de facto veto over the critical uh, EPA rules uh, that uh, is supposed to be under consideration uh, in this uh, subcommittee. But if this bill is going to give EPA, uh, DOE that authority, then we should, at the very least, ensure that DOE is basing its decisions on all of the relevant facts. Mr. Chairman, if I have, I have nine seconds of the, oh, I don't have nine seconds. <laughs> so I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time, and thank you for explaining the amendment. Uh, I might make a comment that this legislation, of course, is designed that if a EPA regulation would cost more than $1 billion, we want to be sure that it does not have significant adverse effects on the economy, and that's the purpose of Dr. Cassidy's legislation. Uh, we, we all know that EPA uh, does a great job of looking at benefits. But uh, Mr. Barton, I believe, has an amendment, and he raised an issue that this legislation did not look at benefits. So I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Texas uh, to make comments, because I think he has an amendment on the same thing. I do. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to engage the uh, author of the amendment, the esteemed congressman from uh, the south side of Chicago, uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a dialogue, if he'd be happy to do that. I, I welcome the opportunity to, to engage my good friend from the great state of Texas uh, in dialogue. All right. Here we come. Here we're we cooking. go now. In Texas, we're cooking with gas. <laughs> Chairman Rush, uh, this, your amendment actually has merit. I have, I have recommended to uh, uh, Mr. Whitfield and, and to uh, Chairman Upton that we consider accepting your amendment. Um, uh, we have a few concerns. The, uh, the primary concern is what we're trying to do is, is get the Department of Energy to, to do an independent analysis of what EPA is doing. But having said that, uh, your amendment goes into uh, fairly extensive detail about what should be considered and, and how it should be evaluated. And I happen to think that's a welcome um, addition to the bill. So my question to you would be if Mr. Upton and Mr. Whitfield were to accept your amendment, uh, which means all of us would fall in line and in spite of our independent streak, we would support our chairman, would um, would you work with Mr. Whitfield and, and Mr. Upton between now and full committee to work out <clears throat> some of the uh, concerns about the Department of Energy being independent as opposed to uh, perhaps being too collaborative with the Environmental Protection Agency? So we're, we're actually saying we'll accept almost everything in your amendment if you will agree to try to define this uh, uh, collaboration with the department with, between EPA and DOE. Would, would the gentleman yield? I'll, yield. It, 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 one of our concerns, Mr. Rush, is uh, page two, line eight and nine. It says the Secretary of Energy, in coordination with the administer, administrator of the EPA, we just want to be, have that be independent. 
Gentleman yield to me for a clarification yeah. of this? Yeah. Uh, it's Mr. Bartenstein. Yeah. I'm happy to yield to yeah, my Yeah, thank you. Now, the, the heart of the bill is to let DOE trump EPA, even though the, the law gives EPA the authority under the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, other statutes. EPA has the authority and the responsibility to do what's necessary. And they're supposed to take in consideration the costs and the benefits. Now, what you would agree to if you accept Mr. Rush's proposal is that DOE could look at not just the costs, but the benefits. But still, I presume you give DOE the ability to say, EPA, we don't accept your determination of the cost-benefit analysis for a regulation. We're going to supersede you. Is that correct? Well, the, the, the underlying Cassidy bill is, is fairly specific that the Department of Energy is to do an independent analysis of any EPA regulation that costs more than $1 billion. Mr. Rush's amendment goes through and in elaborate detail uh, um, outlines all the factors that should be considered. He, he has a, a phrase in coordination with the EPA and that tends to dilute the independence of the Department of Energy. So all I'm asking, and Chairman Upton and, and Chairman Whitfield have this concern, would Mr. Rush be not we're, not, we're not asking him to surrender or take it out, we're just saying between now and full committee, could that phrase in coordination <coughs> be, be discussed and perhaps uh, defined so that we still get um, a second or an independent look by the Department of Energy. That's Gen it. Gentlemen, yield to me. Yes, sir. So you have the EPA, which is supposed to do its job enforcing these laws. Now the bill gives DOE the authority to do an independent analysis and not to coordinate with EPA, but in, in effect to supersede EPA. I've never heard of, uh, e of DOE doing that kind of analysis. After all, we're spending money for EPA to do that kind of analysis. Maybe we need a third agency to break the tie if they have different opinions. But <laughs> what kind of capability and what kind of well, cost is it going to be for DOE we, to we, do we that? We don't want to beat this horse to death. Um, some of us have concerns that the EPA hasn't done a very good job of ana analyzing anything. Some on your yeah. side think they're the world's best. Gentlemen's time is We're just trying to get Mr. Rush to say, would he work with us between now and full committee? If he says yes, we'll accept it. If he'd rather not, then we won't. Gentlemen's time has expired. Does the gentleman of California seek recognition? Yeah, I do seek recognition. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Well, you ought to take Mr. Rush's amendment because it makes sense. If you want him and you want me and anybody else to say we'll continue to talk to you, of course we'll continue to talk to you. But I still think the basic bill that you have it's just so unprecedented. You're going to have EPA. If you don't think EPA is doing a good job, we ought to focus on that and figure out how to improve it. But then to have another agency come in and redo the job, if you want them to give an independent analysis, like I suppose they could do that. It's not so simple because the voluminous records and questions that have to be reviewed, DOE, I don't think, has the capability to do it now, but we could give them the capability. After all, we have un unused money that... Uh, we want to spend uh, on something like this, we could probably cut food stamps even more. But the, um, but the point is, w it, I think there's a, I'm expressing for myself a basic concern about the underlying bill. If you want to discuss it further, fine. But I'm just expressing that concern. I, I hope you take Mr. Rush's amendment if it's got merit on that reason, for that reason alone. If Mr. Rush, is, is willing to continue talking, uh, I would certainly uh, support that and, and join with him, but I think there's a fundamental flaw in the legislation itself. I do, uh, Mr. Chairman, urge members to vote for the Rush Amendment because it makes sense. Uh, we ought to have uh, 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 the, 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 the proponents of the bill argue that enhance transparency, provide rigorous analysis of these rules. Well, you can't do that if you're only looking at one side of the, of the ledger. So uh, Mr. Rush's amendment would say, look at, look at both costs and not just costs, but benefits as well. So I urge people to support the Rush amendment. Does the gentleman yield back or is it? 
Uh, I, uh, anybody wants me to yield? I guess the question is well, whether you would accept the Russia amendment. Okay. Well, I, let me. Uh, I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes. Of course, we, I think we recognize that there is a fundamental difference on the two parties on this committee about uh, EPA. Uh, we know that their rules are unusually expensive. We, we believe firmly that we're losing jobs because of the, some of these regulations. Dr. Casty is trying to address that, and in his legislation he says that the Secretary of Energy, in consultation with the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Labor, the Administrator of the Small Business Administration, shall determine whether or not there's been significant uh, adverse effects to the economy by some of these EPA rules. So since Mr. Barton and others over here uh, do agree with Mr. Rush that benefits should be looked at, and we already have the Energy Secretary consulting with four or five other government agencies in making a determination, if the gentleman from Chicago would be willing to work with us uh, between now and the full committee to see if we could uh, uh, come up with language. Uh, maybe we could even include EPA, but this is Dr. Cassidy's bill, and I don't want to speak for him, but we would uh, obviously there's people on our side of the aisle that agree with Mr. Rush about the benefits should be looked at, even though we know EPA always looks closely at benefits and is very proud about talking about those benefits. Uh, so I would ask the gentleman if he w w would, would w withdraw the amendment and we would work in a sincere, honest way. Maybe we can reach an agreement. Maybe we can't. Uh, but uh, I, at this time, I would like to yield to the gentleman from Virginia because Mr. Griffith had been trying to seek recognition also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I, I recognize there's always uh, should be that willingness for everyone to uh, work together and try to re resolve these. But I would uh, remind folks, and, and some of the, and I think it was very appropriate, uh, the, the gentleman from California, in saying he still had concerns about the bill because that is one of the things you have to look at. And in Jefferson's Manual of Parliamentary Procedure, he says, in talking about making amendments to bills, that you really ought not offer uh, extensive amendments to bills unless, if that amendment's adopted, you anticipate that you will support the bill. And and so as we go forward and look at this language that. Uh, that Mr. Rush has uh, proposed and, and has some benefits, and as that language is negotiated, I would remind folks of Jefferson's admonition that a bill like a child should not be placed with one who cares for it not. Okay. I yield back. I, I still have two minutes left. To, I'd like to yield my <clears throat> two minutes to Dr. Cassidy if he might make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if the spirit of this is truly one to make it better, I would accept the amendment. My concerns, and I think the concerns of many of the witnesses that have come before us, is that when the EPA defines benefits, that those benefits are even specious, or at least poorly supported by the science upon which they are theoretically based. Now, this would be, for example, quoting the National Academy of Science and their analysis of the formaldehyde rule, as well as others that have testified before us. So if we're going to kind of bring people together, one, to kind of um, iron sharpeneth iron, where the science of one is tested by the science understanding of the other, then I think that this could strengthen that bill, and I would be willing to accept it, with, with the caveats that my colleagues, yeah, Mr. Whitfield and Mr. Barton, have proposed. So uh, uh, I yield back. I would ask the gentleman the question. I yield back balance my time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm not going to withdraw the amendment. Now, I would, uh, if, uh, if the chairman and the of the rank uh, of the subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee, if they would uh, uh, agree that uh, b between now and the full committee, that those of us who are on our side who want to have some uh, discussions around. Uh, what your issues are, then I, I, I think that that's something that we should do. But um, I, I really wanted to say that uh, the points that Mr. Waxman made during uh, his time, uh, those are vital points uh, that should be strongly considered 
by the members of the subcommittee, and uh, I think that those are the points that will probably frame our particular uh, discussion as we go forward. So I uh, would uh, 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 agree uh, that between now and full committee that there will be further discussions uh, uh, if, in fact, the majority uh, uh, accepts my amendment. Let me get my, this clarified here. We've indicated that we would engage in a very serious way at trying to address your concerns because uh, Mr. Barton and others have raised the same issue on our side. Uh, I guess there are some fundamental differences, but I do think that if the gentleman would work with us, uh, we'll get the staffs together and try to come up with a sincere effort to reach an agreement on your amendment. Uh, and if we do that, I would just ask the gentleman, would you, you would not object then if we not uh, have a vote on your amendment today or that we simply set it aside and we'll uh, continue to negotiate as we move forward to the full committee? Mr. Chairman, that is not what was originally proposed. The Mr. Upton, uh, Mr. Barton, my friend from Texas, indicated that he would be willing to accept the amendment today. And if I would agree that between now and the full committee, that we could have more discussions huh. uh, and better discussions uh, on uh, points of, dis of disagreement. Okay, well, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. Mr. Barton said that he'd be willing to accept the amendment. Are you, are you saying you'd be willing to accept his amendment? Not right now. Well, Mr. Chairman? No. Yeah, yes. The last time we were told on the Democratic side that uh, a member should hold back on an amendment that you thought you would accept was when we were doing the Keystone Pipeline bill and Ms. Capps had an amendment on the uh, tar sands being taxed the same way as other oil, and she pulled back. And then the bill went to the floor, and that was not in it. There was no further discussion. If you think Mr. Rush's amendment makes sense and you want to show some good faith and op open up some negotiations to further uh, enhance the bill, his amendment makes your bill a lot more attractive. And if Mr. Rush is willing to talk to you further about making the bill better and maybe good enough for Democrats to vote for it, I think uh, that should be good enough for you to take the amendment. But all you're doing is dangling the possibility that you'll take the Rush Amendment, which has merit, according to your own side, only later. You can take it out, but uh, the, it's a hollow promise that maybe you'll take it when you think it makes sense, but only after uh, some kind of process. So I would urge you to take the amendment and um, and if you want to vote against it, vote against it. But we're, I, would, I would say that if you want, don't want to accept it, I would ask you to vote against it. Is it yeah. Why don't you accept it? Because it certainly makes sense and it makes your bill better. Well, I mean, one Not of the... good enough for me yet, but better bill. <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson, I know, would approve yeah. of the argument that I'm making. You offer amendments to improve a bill. It may not be a sufficient improvement, and you always have that danger. Do you, do you, you make a, better, a bad bill better, uh, it makes it harder to defeat, or uh, can you get to the point where if you make it better, then you don't have that much of a gap to work through to get uh, a bill that we could agree to? Well, you know, that's why we're excited about this discussion with you, because we do think there's a chance to make the bill even better. And uh, I can tell you that if, if, if who wants to talk? I recognize the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania for uh, five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield to uh, Mr. Park. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. I, I want to bring a, put a little more reality check into this discussion. I was very sincere when I discussed with Chairman Upton and Chairman Whitfield that we accept the Rush Amendment if he would agree to work with us between now and full committee because I think it does have merit. It does have merit. But having said that, I've been on both sides in this committee. I've been in the majority and I've been in the minority. The majority has the votes. So when, when the majority reaches out to the minority and says, will you work with us, it's usually, at least when I was in the minority, I said yes. 
because I might get something. Well, the gentleman yield? Well, in a second. Now, you know, there was a good faith effort. Mr. Cassidy even said he would accept him. So the author of the bill, one of the senior Republicans, the chairman, the subcommittee chairman, and, and the minority's position is, well, take our amendment and we might and we might not. But the heck if we're going to actually vote for the bill. So if you're not going to vote for the underlying bill, we'll vote no we, on the amendment. We've got the votes. You know that. Hmm? You know that, Henry. You're smiling like the Cheshire cat. <laughs> That's so okay. I thank my friend from Pennsylvania for yielding. Well, I'm going to recommend a no vote on the uh, Miss, Miss, Rush Miss, Amendment, Miss, and then maybe they'll would work. The gentleman yield? <laughs> Mr. Gentleman, yield. Will the gentleman yield to the gentleman from Chicago? I'm <laughs> always honored to yield to my friend from Chicago. <laughs> I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Jefferson, when he wrote his uh, treatise, he, uh, Texas wasn't a state. And so he had never heard of the Texas. Those were the good old days. The Texas right. two-step. All right. <laughs> and that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of the Texas two-step. All right. Uh, and therefore, I really want to, uh, I would take the gentleman uh, first appeal to the minority. And that is that, the, that your side will accept the uh, my amendment, and then between now and full committee, that we will have further discussions on whatever points of differences that we may have. Now, at the conclusion of those discussions, if and when they occur, does not lock anybody into on, on either side uh, into a vote for or against the under, underlying bill. I, don't, I think that's ludicrous. You can't tie. Uh, uh, actions and, uh, and, and uh, of either side or either member to any further actions uh, at this point in time. So I just think that I accept the spirit and the faith of the gentleman from Texas. So you are now changed your mind and you're willing to work with us? I'm willing to work with you upon acceptance by your side of my amendment. Will the gentleman from Texas yield for a second? I may have been overruled, yeah. but I will yeah. yield. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, you know, we 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 haven't denied any amendments that have been germane to this committee in the in the two and a half years that I've been chairman. We won't deny it again. I mean, you'll have that opportunity uh, to work this in full committee when we take that up. Uh, I'd like to suggest to the gentleman that he withdraw it now. Let's see if we can work something out between now and then. If we can't, gentleman has the perfect right to offer it. First Amendment uh, when, when we do this in, in full committee, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. But why don't we just work on a, on a couple yeah. little tweets to this thing now, uh, between uh, now and the, and the full committee, and uh, look in earnest to, to do that in good faith. Would the gentleman you? I, I think Mr. Pitt. Did I Mr. Pitt it's Mr. Pitt's time. <laughs> I'll, I'll yield. The gentleman look, yields to the gentleman of California. I just want to give you, so a lot of your members weren't here when you were in the minority. But I want to give you a sense of what, how I'm hearing what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. You allow us to offer germane amendments. We have an absolute right to offer germane amendments. You let us talk within our five minutes. We have an absolute right to do that. We were elected in a district with the, about the same population as all of you. You have the majority of Republicans. But don't we think that we ought to figure out together what's the best approach on a policy basis? Does it have to be Democrat versus Republican? I, I just have a, a sense that you're being okay. a bit patronizing, or at least I'm hearing it that way, when you say, you've got a good amendment, but uh, you're not even saying take the whole bill, but be willing to talk to us. We could trust you, but we do have an example not too long ago where Mrs. Capps was asked to trust you, and then her amendment was forgotten, because after all, she's in the minority. We know we're in the minority. You don't talk to us to try to work out bills. Quite frankly, you don't pass laws out of this committee unless you work with us on a bipartisan basis. So don't, don't treat us like uh, we, we, we don't share the concerns and want to discuss with you how to mess, make the best policy. If we have our differences, let's debate them. It didn't always used to be that every Democrat had to vote one way and every Republican the other way. But if this is a partisan issue and you don't want to consider uh, 
the benefits as well as the costs, I vote this down. But, uh, but I, I just want you to understand how we're hearing it. And is Mr. Barton still here? Uh, yeah, you, you remember what it was like, but you don't remember it like this because we were never that way to you. <laughs> don't get me started. Yeah. But, yeah. I, but I, I, what I, you said at the beginning, Mr. Waxman, is exactly right. You have an absolute right to offer germane amendments. You have an absolute right to speak five minutes on them. You have an absolute right to accept or withdraw. You are absolutely right, and I will back you to the hilt on that. Mr. Pitt's time has expired. So uh, I'd recognize the gentleman from uh, Louisiana for five minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. And, uh, you know, I was here in the majority and in the minority, and, you know, it's, it's definitely a lot more enjoyable in the majority. But uh, during the time that, that we were in the minority, I didn't see as open and willing offer from the majority to take an amendment. And, and there's an offer to take the amendment if there's some changes. I mean, I look through the amendment, and I see some problems with the language. It's a little bit one-sided in some areas that, that need improvement. And so the offer uh, from my colleague from Texas and my colleague from Louisiana and others was that if you agree to work with us between here and the full committee, then we could take the amendment. And, and, and it seems like the minority doesn't know how to take yes for an answer. And, and so, you know, I think my friend from Virginia did a good job of quoting Jefferson. Maybe we need to hear some more, uh, some more quotes from Jefferson. And with that, I would yield to uh, well, my friend from Virginia, Mr. Griffith. Mr. Chairman, I move to table the amendment. Okay, a motion has been made to table the amendment. Uh, this is a non-debatable motion, so all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. chairman. No, 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 no. Let it go. Because, in, Chairman, may I be recognized on a, point a, a parliamentary procedure? Has, has yeah. the motion carried? No, not yet. Well, not yet, but I, Because if it carries, the whole bill goes. What do you mean by that? Thomas Jefferson said, <laughs> the rules of the House say, if you offer the motion to table an amendment, the whole bill is tabled. Well, just a minute, we'll, we'll talk to our wait, parliamentarian. Go check with the parliamentarian, the, but if you want to vote to table How has the, the chair, the parliamentary vote. inquiry, Mr. Chairman, how have you called the voice vote? I'm sorry? How have you called the voice vote? Well, we call for voice vote. We had the eyes. And the, how did, we had how the eyes. did you call it? Did Before you... I called it, uh, he asked for a roll call vote. Okay. So at, at this point, I have not called vote. But I'm discussing with our parliamentarian right now. Okay. Well, that's all my fault. I tried to okay. I, this is what we're going to do. Uh, will the gentleman withdraw the motion to table? Yeah. The gentleman withdraws the motion to table. We made a sincere effort. Mr. At Mr. Chairman? Yes. Let me, let me just go on and finish. We made a sincere effort to sit down and, and have a discussion about this amendment before we go to the full committee. Because as I said, there are people on this side of the aisle that agree, even though EPA does an exceptionally good job talking about benefits, we are trying to focus on the effect and the impact on the economy and on loss of jobs. That was the purpose of the Dr. Cassidy's uh, bill. So at this point, if there's no further discussion on the Rush Amendment and whether it passes, whether it's adopted, your amendment's adopted or not adopted, as I will have our staff work and see if we can perfect it and from our view before the committee. But is there any yes, further discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, may I inquire? It seems to me that the offer was made to accept the amendment if Mr. Rush would continue to talk to the Republican side of the aisle on this bill as it moves to full committee, which as far as I know could be two hours from now, the way bills rush through here. But if that's not good enough and he said yes, well, he said, Mr. Barton, that, that, Mr. Barton was the one that said yes, but Mr. Barton said no. I changed my mind. <laughs> oh, you withdrew your offer to him if he said yes? He said we're overruled. Okay. And, Good, I got, I got overruled, but I, my initial offer. You're just too uh, generous to us. I, you think you don't, we can't accept you. All I'm doing right now is trying yes. to find out how the chair has called the voice vote. If he, if he says the ayes have it, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. If he says the noes have it, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's my time, and I yeah. would like to reclaim the time and yeah. yield back. Okay, gentleman back reclaims his time, time, yields back his time. So at this point, if there's no further discussion, the vote will be on the Rush Amendment. 
All those in favor of the Russian amendment will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call vote. Okay. The roll call, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Pitts. No. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Terry. No. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess votes no. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Cassidy. No. Mr. Cassidy votes no. Mr. Olson. No. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Yeah. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes no. Chairman Upton. Chairman Upton votes no. Chairman Whitfield? No. Chairman Whitfield votes no. Mr. Rush? Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney? Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Tonko? Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Markey? Mr. Engel? Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Green? Mr. Green votes aye. Mrs. Capps? Mr. Doyle? Mr. Doyle votes aye. Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui? Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Christensen votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Waxman. They sure taught us a lesson. I vote aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Clerk will. Uh, are, are there any, is there anyone else that would like to cast a vote? Anyone want to change their vote? The clerk will report the result. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 11 ayes and 16 nays. R repeat that. 11 ayes and 16 nays. 11 ayes, 16 nays. The agreement is not agreed to. Are, are there further amendments to H.R. 1582? I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 1582 offered by Mr. Barton of Texas. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with, and the gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes in support of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is not as um, detailed or as descriptive as the Russia amendment, but there, there are some similarities. Uh, there are, so, there are, are also some differences. Uh, this amendment, if accepted, <clears throat> would require an estimate of the total benefits of the rule and an estimate of when such benefits would be expected to be realized. And so in that sense, it is similar to what Mr. Rush was attempting to get at. Where it differs from the Rush Amendment is that it would require the Environmental Protection Agency <clears throat> to give a description of the modeling, which most of the time they refuse to do under current law, the assumptions, the limitations due to uncertainty, uh, the speculation or lack of information associated with the estimates under, under the the Cassidy bill. So, so it's similar to Mr. Rush in that it, it is requiring an estimate of the total benefits and when those benefits would be expected, but it's different than Mr. Rush's amendment and then it, it, it does require the EPA to detail their modeling and the assumptions underlying their, their estimates. So it's, it's, it would be a a compromise between what Mr. Rush was attempting and what is in the Cassidy bill as it is unamended. I think it improves the bill and I would hope that we could agree to to accept the amendment. Is there a further discussion on uh, the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, this amendment acknowledges that the bill, in the bill, the EPA rules have benefits, but it doesn't fix the serious problem with this legislation because the amendment highlights one of the biggest problems with the bill. EPA already calculates the benefits of its rules and makes those calculations public. But under this amendment, EPA will include those benefits in its report to Congress, but the benefits still won't be included in the DOE's analysis of EPA's rules. So even with the Barton Amendment, the DOA analysis that determines whether EPA rules are blocked 
is still a skewed cost only analysis. The apartment and amendment also suggests that the huge benefits of EPA rules are not real. It requires EPA to report on any limitations of its estimates of benefits. Okay, I have no objection to that, but there's no similar requirement in the amendment or the bill to describe the uncertainties associated with the estimates of the costs. Like the underlying bill, uh, there's the, the, the um, Martin Amendment is setting up a one-sided analysis that stacks the deck against important public health protections. Now, I've, been, I've seen over the years, if you claim that there's exaggeration of benefits, I've seen exaggerations uh, by industry of the costs. And there ought to be a, 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 a comparable requirement on DOE to describe the uncertainties of the costs as you're now placing on EPA to describe the uncertainties of the benefits. The whole deck is stacked against EPA doing the rules they're required to under the various statutes to enforce those statutes by finding whether a rule has benefits that exceed the costs and then subjecting it to DOE veto. Uh, so I, I, um, I, I look, I, I, you want an amendment? I'll, I'll support your amendment. Do you think it makes a better bill? I'm sorry, I don't think it does. It does not remedy any of the significant defects of the bill. Okay, I'll oppose you. I don't care. What difference does it make? You don't listen to what we say. You want a law? You're not going to get a law with this amendment and this bill. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll oppose your amendment. I just changed my mind. I was going to support it before I opposed it. Now I'm going to oppose it because that's what we do here, whatever the whim so uh, the amendment doesn't really address the problem. It's not as good as the, um, as, as the amendment uh, by our friend Mr. Rush, which you even saw merit in. And maybe between now and the full committee, you, uh, you might see further merit in it. But I'm going to post this now, and then I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Mr. Chairman. Yield back my time. Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah, would Mr. Barton yield for one question? I don't believe I have the time, but I have to yield the time I don't have. No, the, uh, at this you, time I recognize the... No, no, I still have time. I'll, I'll reclaim my time by unanimous consent so I could yield to Mr. Hall to give me a zinger. Do you have a zinger you wanted to throw in there? Kind of. The gentleman yields to Mr. Hall. Yes. I just wanted to ask Mr. Barton to apologize to you about that chairman being Cheshire Cat. I have a Cheshire Cat. <laughs> and I just got an email from him <laughs> that he has some rights. I want you to, I wish you'd withdraw that. He's watching television right I will, now. I will withdraw my comment to Mr. Waxman about the Cheshire Cat. I don't want Ralph Hall's sensibilities hurt. Does the gentleman, does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Cassidy, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually support the amendment. I speak in favor of it. The National Academy of Science, when they did a review of the method of what the EPA does, they were very harsh in that the EPA does not publish their methodology. In fact, they said on the formaldehyde rule as one example that they can, that their, um, I could pull up the quote, but it was along to say that, that the, to extrapolate from their body of material as the EPA did could not be supported by that which EPA had put forward. Others have said the same thing, saying that the way that the EPA is using these statistics is misleading to policymakers. Now, these are witnesses who have come before our Congress. So I, th I am, believe me, I've been in discussion with our uh, staff, how do we make this analysis of the benefits better? If all we're doing is asking the EPA, or for that matter, the DOE, to publish their methodology, we are listening to the scientists. The scientists at the National Academy of Science has said that's what we should do. By the way, this is important for transparency. If you recall the formaldehyde rule, they only gave like a 60-day comment period, so the Texas Department of Environmental Quality had to go out and get a bunch of mathematicians to attempt to put together their analysis. It was very difficult because it was not explained. As a physician who commonly reads medical scientific literature, if the methodology is not put in place, the article is not considered valid. Indeed, I asked the National Academy of Science if they would publish, if those scientists 
would accept the EPA's analysis of formaldehyde in a peer-reviewed journal, and they said that they would not. It was not strong enough science or strong enough analysis. So all Mr. Barton is doing is basically asking the EPA to adhere to that which a scientific journal would demand of an author. Tell us how you do it, tell us how you got your conclusions, and let, let us do a double check. Now, if you also, the attraction of the Russia Amendment is that, frankly, I think that should also be done for the DOE. If the DOE is going to come to a finding, have them publish exactly how they do it. It shouldn't just be ex cathedra, this is what we think you should do, this is how you do it. It should be, no, this is how we got to that conclusion. Now critique and proof us. So I speak in favor, just as I was to accept the Rush Amendment, I speak in favor of this amendment because it actually allows the scientists to look at their data to make sure that one side or the other has not politicized it, but indeed it's something that we can all say we have been directed in the appropriate way. Uh, so I speak heartily in favor of the uh, support of this. This gentleman yield back balance of his time. I, unless there's somebody else who would like it, I otherwise yield back. Gentleman yields back balance of his time. Is there a further discussion? Since there's no further discussion, uh, all those in favor of the Barton Amendment will signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And uh, the amendment is adopted. Are there further amendments to H.R. 1582? The question now then would occur on forwarding H.R. 1582 to the full committee as amended. All those in favor would say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 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 The ayes appear to have it, the ayes have it, and the bill is agreed to. So now we call up what? The chair would now call up H.R. Mr. Chairman, let us have a roll call on the final, on the last act. Okay, uh, the clerk will call the roll on the passage of H.R. 1582. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes aye. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Rush. No. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. McNerney. No. Mr. McNerney votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Ingle. Mr. Ingle votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle. Doyle votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Chairman Whitfield. Aye. Chairman Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Are there other members? Oh, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes aye. Are there further votes? Clerk uh, will then now re report the result. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 17 ayes and 10 nays. 17 ayes and 10 nays. Uh, the uh, legislation is agreed to and reported out of the subcommittee. The chair will now call up H.R. 1900 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 1900, to provide for the timely consideration of all licenses, permits, and approvals required under federal law with respect to the siting, construction, expansion, or operation of any natural gas pipeline projects. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with, and the bill will be open for amendment at any point. Uh, so ordered. Uh, are there any uh, amendments to the bill? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. 
Amendment the clerk, number uh, one. The clerk will uh, report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 1900 offered by Mr. Rush. The gentleman from Chicago is recognized for five minutes in support of this amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment strikes the part of the bill that provides, that permits automatically go into effect if agencies do not approve or deny the permits in 90 days. Mr. Chairman, no one can explain how this provision would work. These permits aren't yes or no decisions. They can be, they can be detailed documents that need to be written by the various agencies. It doesn't make any sense to mandate that an unwritten permit automatically takes effect. This provision could have serious environmental consequences. It could result in permits being issued that are inconsistent with the requirements of the nation's environmental laws. We received technical comments from some of the agencies whose permitting process would be affected by this provision. And here's what the agencies responsible for implementing these laws told us. The Army Corps of Engineers stated, and I quote, this legislation could allow certain activities to proceed despite potential adverse and significant impacts to aquatic resources and without appropriate compensatory mitigation. The EPA stated it would severely limit states' ability to ensure that discharges comply with water quality standards. The EPA also stated this requirement could potentially result in sources receiving an in inadequate permit or a permit that does not assure compliance with the Clean Air Act, the end of quote. The Bureau of Land Management stated, and I quote, unduly short time frames could cause the BLM to deny pipeline right away applications rather than allow approval to automatically take effect as provided in H.R. 1900, end of quote. Further, the Fish and Wildlife Services raised similar concerns. The agency stated that, and I quote, the automatic approval of an ego permit contravenes the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, end of quote. The service also stated that, and I quote, this legislation is in direct conflict, end of quote, quote, with the National Wildlife Refuge Statute. Mr. Chairman, agencies should act expeditiously on pipeline applications, but they also need time to conduct the necessary environmental and safety reviews. They must be able to set appropriate terms and conditions to protect the environment and to, to protect the public self. And the permits should obviously meet the underlying statutory requirement. Mr. Chairman, I urge all the members of this subcommittee to support my amendment, which addresses a glaring problem with this bill. And I yield back the balance of my time. Jim yields back the balance of this time. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. I, I oppose the Rush Amendment. It, it entirely eliminates uh, the, the motive force of the very amendment. Uh, Mr. Rush wants to set no deadline for an agency to perform its tasks. He, he identifies a handful of agencies that say, uh, they're concerned about uh, being unduly rushed. Uh, it doesn't surprise me 
uh, that agencies don't want to be held accountable to do their job. It doesn't surprise me that they'd rather have all the time they need to uh, toddle along and wander around and, and, and not issue permits in a timely fashion um, uh, and not be held accountable when, when, when they don't achieve that objective. Uh, we heard a lots of testimony yesterday about the appropriate start point for the time period. I'm willing to work with folks on that. Indeed, I've worked with folks on the other side of the aisle on that. Hopefully, we can improve that as we move to full committee. Uh, we heard from Commissioner Moeller that he was worried about um, complete applications and the timing for starting the time period for approval. I'm happy to work uh, to develop a, the appropriate time that we can deem an application complete so we can start. Um, but with respect to forcing the agencies to do the job, uh, I'm, I'm not willing to compromise. The striking of Section J3 uh, would do that. You know, I, I, I asked witnesses yesterday, I asked folks across the aisle to provide an alternative solution for holding agencies accountable to perform their task. What could we do other than uh, putting a schedule of timing in? Uh, and there, there was really no option presented for holding the agencies accountable. The, the option of, of someone suing, filing a lawsuit uh, to, to get the government to, to do its job was about the best uh, uh, they could come with. I find that wholly unsatisfactory. Uh, there were suggestions yesterday, too, that uh, deeming a, a certificate or approval uh, complete after a certain time period was unheard of, unprecedented, dangerous, uh, you know, uh, 12 U.S.C. 1865, the Bank Service Company Act says in the event of board, a federal bank, banking agency doesn't do its job, the application shall be, quote, deemed approved. Uh, 16 U.S.C. 47 L.I., the National Forest and Pinelands National Reserve Act, the Secretary shall, and if he doesn't, uh, fail to act on the proposed plan within 90 days, the plan shall be regarded as approved. Uh, and indeed, that same thing happens in our uh, environmental statutes, in the Clean Water Act itself. Uh, 33 U.S.C. 1299, we've got a provision that says if the administrator does not approve or dis disapprove an application within 45 days of receipt, the application shall be deemed approved. In the Clean Air Act, 42 U.S.C. 7545, the regulation of motor fuels, if the administrator fails to act within a 180-day period, the fuel shall be deemed certified until the administrator completes action on the petition. So this is, this is not unheard of. It is not unprecedented. Uh, we're offering plenty of time between the pre-certification process and the completion. This is not unduly uh, rushing any agency, uh, and I urge the rejection of the Rush Amendment. I yield back. Gentleman yields back the balance of this time. The uh, gentleman from California seek recognition. Yes. Gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Um, I want to thank Mr. Rush for offering this amendment. The subcommittee heard from several expert witnesses yesterday about the potential effects of this bill, which I think was very helpful in informing the members of this committee of its pros and cons. Um, it was Commissioner Moeller's opinion that while FERC could meet the 12-month deadline at the point of application, at the point at which the application was considered complete, however, he also knew that it would become increasingly difficult to meet the timeline as FERC resources continue to shrink and applications for pipelines continue to grow. In addition, the underlying bill requires agencies assisting FERC in the permit decision process to issue a decision with 90 days or 120 days if an extension is granted. If the permit decision hasn't been made at the end of that time period, the permit is deemed approved. Well, I share Commissioner Moeller's view that we need to ensure state and federal agencies don't unnecessarily delay permit decisions, but states may have different considerations when it comes to their responsibilities under the joint efforts uh, like NEPA and the Clean Air Act. This is an issue that happened in my district when several state and federal agencies worked together to approve a five-year permit for an invasive weed in the largest estuary in the United States. It took about a month and a half longer than expected because the issue is complex. Dealing with fresh and salt water, the environmental and agricultural impacts, the effects on public health, I know the agencies involved have the best intentions at hand, and they eventually arrived at a solution that all parties agreed on and is now uh, being implemented, and very successfully, I might add. Uh, this story highlights my concern that a 90-day window could result in incomplete analysis of permits that would have far-ranging impact on environment and the economy. The permit for the invasive weed that I just referred to was approved about a month and a half later than it was expected, that the end result was the right decision. Furthermore, as we've heard from witnesses yesterday, it's unclear what an improved permit would look like. 
whether it's simply incomplete or something that doesn't comply with federal statute. Both the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers highlighted these same concerns. None of the witnesses yesterday were able to provide a definitive answer to that concern. Additionally, we don't have the impact from other federal or state agencies about the permitting process and whether or not the 90 days is a reasonable time frame. I believe even Mr. Pompeo stated that it was an arbitrary number, the 90 days. I want to see pipelines approved. However, I believe they should go through the proper examination by experts at both the federal and state level. This will help to ensure pipeline safety as well as environmental and public health. Based on the testimony we heard, it seems that 90 or 120 day requirement has the potential to create greater uncertainty, having the opposite effect of the provision's intent. So I ask the majority, be careful what you ask for, you might just get it. Natural gas production and natural gas pipeline construction will expand over the coming years, something that will benefit our economy and our energy security. FERC, the GAO, and the natural gas industry all believe the permitting process is consistent and working well. Because of these reasons, I uh, urge my colleagues to support the Rush Amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion on the Rush Amendment? Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the arbitrary deadlines established by this bill raise uh, serious concerns, but the worst provision may be the one that automatically grants environmental permits for a pipeline project if an agency does not make a decision on the permit within 90 days of the issuance of FERC's environmental analysis. Uh, this automatic permitting provision broadly applies to the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, and the rights of way through federal lands. So under this bill, if an agency cannot complete its review of a permit application by the arbitrary 90-day deadline, then no one checks to make sure that the project won't have an adverse impact on the environment or public health. The permit is just magically issued. These permits are detailed documents that include emission limits, technology or operating requirements, conditions to ensure the environment is protected. Agencies need to figure out all of these details and then actually draft the permit. So at, at the hearing yesterday, uh, I asked the witness, what would it mean for a permit that might not even be written to be automatically take effect if a deadline is missed? And the answer was, no, nobody knows how that would work. No one had an idea. Uh, it's a provision that is based on, I think, a misunderstanding of what is required to issue these uh, uh, permits. Uh, they're going to be, and we're talking about after the, um, the EPA analysis, uh, they are, there are going to be real environmental and safety impacts if permits automatically go into effect without any agency analysis or conditions. For example, the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA provided technical comments on the bill. They raised concerns that automatic permitting could lead to permits that are inconsistent with the requirements of the Clean, Air, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. This could lead to environmentally harmful water or air pollution. Automatically issuing a permit without an agency confirming that the legal requirements are met is also going to increase the risk of litigation and undermine the public's acceptance of interstate natural gas pipelines going through their communities. So the, the Rush Amendment uh, doesn't fix all of the problems with this bill, but it eliminates an unworkable provision that threatens protections for public health, safety, and the environment. That's not a Democratic or Republican position. We all should want the uh, provisions uh, to, uh, uh, to, to protect uh, public health, safety, and environment to be uh, effective and to limit uh, the period of time uh, for this arbitrary 90 days uh, is going to put us in a situation where rather than get permits approved faster, it could be slowed down, it could be approved and then litigated. A lot of people would look at these permits as not really uh, desirable because they haven't been reviewed carefully. So I, I think that um, all, the rest of the bill would remain intact, uh, but the Russia, Russia Amendment uh, makes make sure that uh, uh, we get this analysis that I think ought to be made. And uh, it's appropriate that, that uh, 
uh, the rush amendment should keep the rushing of these uh, permits, which could have adverse impact uh, that we should all want to avoid. So I uh, support uh, the Rush Amendment. In fact, I, I'm Rush here to support the Rush Amendment because it's a good amendment. Yield back my time. Gentlemen, yield back balance this time. Is there further discussion on the Rush Amendment? Uh, gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, too, support the Rush Amendment essentially for the reasons that Mr. Waxman uh, just, just gave. Um, I, I want to uh, say, though, that um, a number of us will be uh, working on uh, this uh, bill to make it better from, from my point of view uh, over the next several days. And, and I hope that we can uh, make it better. Um, I, I think that the uh, delays are not a, a good thing for delay's sake. And uh, I understand what the, what the gentleman, Mr. Pompeo, is, is trying to do. Um, and and I'm, I'm sympathetic because I do think that decisions need to be made one way or the other, um, not just delaying and delaying and delaying. But but I think that um, by by automatically um, saying that something is deemed approved, I think that that's worse uh, than delay, because I don't want anything that's 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 deemed approved um, if it's not uh, going to be if that's going to meet in, in environmental standards and other things. So I think Mr. Rush's amendment, as is Mr. Dingell's amendment, are two amendments that really improve the bill, and I would hope they could be accepted. If they're not accepted, uh, then I hope that the next uh, several days uh, before uh, this bill gets to the full committee, uh, we can find out other ways to uh, improve the bill, and hopefully there can be a bill that um, many of us can vote for. I know there have been negotiations going on, not only uh, with, with my office, but with, with others as well. Um, but I think Mr. Rush's bill uh, makes this a lot, a lot better. I think the, the um, provision of the bill that I have the most objection to is the section of the bill that automatically deems permits approved if permitting agencies miss the 90-day deadline to approve or deny these permits. Um, I, I think that's a very, uh, very uh, bad uh, situation. And, uh, I support the Russian amendment. I yield back. And Mr. Engel yields back the balance of his time. Is there further discussion on the Russian amendment? The gentleman from Texas is recognized five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and, and thank uh, um, our colleagues. I, I, the bill is addressing an issue that all of us are sensitive to in the regulatory delay and the lack of certainty and expansion, in this case, of pipelines. Um, my concern uh, yesterday after our hearing, and, and I mentioned it a few times, there were about three issues. And I think uh, yesterday evening, thanks for all those votes, about 10 o'clock at night, Mr. Pompeo and I got to talk about a couple of the amendments on, uh, you know, putting in some language and uh, the start the clock once uh, there's a confirmed applications complete or whether pre-filing be mandatory for certain pipelines. Uh, and, you know, FERC does so many permitting. It's not just uh, pipelines we're talking about, but there's also compressor statements that's on private property that may not fit in the same uh, category as a pipeline that we need when we're working on this amendment to talk about it. But to talk about Mr. Rush's amendment, one of the big concerns I have is I can't think of any example in federal law or even state law in Texas when I was a legislator where if you ran out of time, you deem that permit or that approval. And, uh, and I know talking to Ms. Pompeo, um, there may be some things we can do on that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we have an amendment now that uh, our ranking member has, and I intend to support the amendment. But I would hope before we get to the full committee, we can look at this and say, how can we deal with the deemed issue? Um, because there is frustration, although from the testimony from Mr. Mola yesterday, uh, you know, when 90 percent of the permits are being approved um, in it seems like it's it's not as major an issue. Plus, FERC is working well, and I hate to overlay them with something that may not work. And the last thing I'll say is that if there is an issue, we it'd be better if we dealt with it through our committee process, because once a bill gets to the floor, it's a pretty party line vote. And if it's a a bill that like some of our natural resources bill from last Congress, they go to the Senate and they disappear. 
So we're still not going to solve whatever problem there is with FERC with uh, regulatory certainty. And so uh, will, I appreciate will, will the working the, will the yield? with I'd be glad I, uh, to yield to my colleague from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Green. We did have a good conversation last night. You, you had three concerns. I think we can probably get two of them solved in, in a way that I think folks will find acceptable. So that's more than halfway. So I figure we'll get everybody's vote uh, on the other side. Uh, you know, with respect to deem approve, I'm happy to work on that as well. But I have not heard a single alternative, not one counter proposal that says, well, 90 days is arbitrary. I've heard that about 50 times. Uh, how about 95 days? How about 120 days? I haven't heard anybody provide an alternative that says, hey, that might be too quick. Here's a time period that would be acceptable or an alternative mechanism that says, hey, here's another way to get an agency to actually perform its mission. And so I'm, I'm happy to work with you on it. Um, I think I've got a good solution that meets all the environmental concerns that folks have raised. Uh, if we can make it better and take out this language that you all are concerned about, I'm happy to work on it. But I haven't heard a single thing that's going to cause an agency to actually uh, be required to do their mission. And, and that's important to our national gas industry and to consumers who need affordable electricity. In reclaiming our time, and I agree with you that there may be a way, and if we put some creative minds on it, that deeming it approved may be too far reach, but we can push the agency to make sure, and, and I'd like to see that language in a bill to where the agency knows that they have a time frame to get it done. One of my concerns about deeming it is FERC has to have not only federal agencies input, but state agencies, and we heard that some states are better than others on approving uh, or getting information back. In, you're making, you would deem something that even though a state that maybe not be Kansas or Texas or someone who has a lot of pipelines, um, you would deem it even though they, they haven't done their job. And so that's why deeming it. So maybe we need to, uh, but I, if we can massage that, if we take care of the first two issues, uh, you know, the deeming that uh, we can, maybe we can with different language get to what you're wanting to do. And I'm hoping we can work it. We can have some time before the uh, full committee. And, um, I'll yield back my time. Well, uh, I might just make a comment. There's been a lot of discussion about this. Ninety percent of the applicants were completed within the year. We talked in more detail about this. Yeah, FERC completed ninety percent of the applicants for their process, but then the other agencies, the states, and so forth, they they didn't mean to indicate that ninety percent of all applications were completed in their entirety. If yes. you would yield, yeah. uh, and that's what we need to get to, right. um, but um, how we can force states to respond and, and, right. and, and even other federal agencies to respond in a timely basis, and that's also my other worry. We're doing the energy and water on the floor right. today, and, you know, if we take resources from them, they're, if that's not a priority, they will not use it. But be glad to work with you between now and the Thank uh, you. Uh, is there further discussion on the Rush Amendment? If there's no further discussion on the Rush Amendment, uh, I would ask for a, a question. On, you, you want a roll call vote? Mr. Rush has asked for a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Scalise. No. Mr. Scalise votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes no. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes no. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes no. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes no. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes no. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes no. Mr. Barton. No. Mr. Barton votes no. Mr. Upton. No. Yeah. No. Mr. Upton votes no. Mr. Rush. Aye. Mr. Rush votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Aye. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Markey. Mr. Engel. Aye. Mr. Engel votes aye. Mr. Green. Aye. Mr. Green votes aye. Ms. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes aye. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes aye. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Christensen votes aye. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes aye. Mr. Waxman. Chairman Whitfield. No. Chairman Whitfield votes no. Are there other members who want to record their vote? Mr. Casty votes no. 
Does anyone like to change their vote? The clerk would please call the roll, uh, report the results. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 10 ayes and 14 nays. On the Rush Amendment, 10 ayes, 14 nays, so the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to H.R. 1900? Seeing no further amendments, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 1900. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to H.R. 1900 in the nature of a substitute. Uh, okay, which, Mr. Which I uh, believe is at the clerk's desk. The, the clerk would report the amendment, please. Mr. Amendment. Chairman, I ask you to have consent that the reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Okay, would you report the amendment? Yes. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1900 offered by Mr. Dingle of Michigan. And uh, he made a motion to dispense with the reading, so we won't read it. And the gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes for the purposes of his amendment. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I do not oppose building of natural gas pipelines. I think this is a very necessary activity and something that we ought to be moving forward with. As you will recall in our hearings yesterday, we were, we, the hearings showed us a number of things. First of all, that the legislation is well-intentioned and it's in anticipation of future natural gas pipeline infrastructure. But the committee is, did not and could not, and the bill does not, examine the tools which are available to find out what is going on in this area and whether in fact real problems exist or what they might be. During the testimony yesterday, we heard Commissioner Moeller tell the committee that 90% of the permit applications at FERC are already approved within 12 months and the delays on the remaining 10% are due to the complexities of the proposed projects or incomplete applications by the applicants. Now, there's an old saying, saying, Mr. Chairman, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and that is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, I'm worried about that this legislation, if it were to somehow become law, we would see more permit denials because these 10% of applications that take over 12 months so the regulatory agencies would then be compelled to simply do one thing, and that is to re reject the applications made. During yesterday's testimony, the committee did not hear of any backlog of permit applications that requires or justifies the need for this legislation. Instead of rushing the bill through the committee and onto the floor later this month, I believe the committee should ask whether other federal agencies and the agencies responsible and the states can tell us how the process works and if it needs to be approved, uh, improved. The amendment that I offer simply directs GAO to take another look at the permitting process and to take into consideration the issues raised at yesterday's hearings, including what delays have there been and what caused them, recommendations as to how to fix any identified delays in issuing permits, and to help the committee to identify what is the cause of these delays. What effect appropriations and other resources have affected FERC and other federal agencies to process applications? I have a feeling that a shortage of money, staff, and other resources to the regulatory agencies has slowed the process down. Now, if the report identifies problems, this committee can then use its oversight authority to fix the problems, and should the need arise, I believe the committee would and should, and certainly I would, support sensible legislation to solve the, pro the problems identified in the report. It's always a good idea to look before you leap. And as my old daddy used to say, measure twice and cut once. The factual record on the legislation does not justify the legislation. But finding out the facts and finding out what we need to do 
to make the system work does make good sense. I would urge you to believe that this is a friendly amendment. It's one which will inform the committee of what we need to do to move the process forward. And if we fail to take this action, we're simply going to pass legislation which will achieve nothing, not pass the Senate, not be signed into law by the president, and an opportunity to make a real step forward in terms of finding out what is wrong, if there is something wrong, and seeing to it that we correct that problem or problems, which will then be properly identified, makes good sense. I would urge you, Mr. Chairman, to do to uh, and my colleagues to support the legislation. It is friendly, or rather the amendment. It is a friendly amendment, and it's one which enables the committee to do its job properly, find out what's wrong, correct it, and then move forward. So I would urge my colleagues to support the, the amendment in the nature of a substitute so that we can begin to build the pipelines knowing what is going on and not casting about to change a bunch of environmental laws by imposing requirements on the regulatory agency that it simply can't meet. So I yield back the balance of my time, and I thank you for your courtesy. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan yield back, yields back the balance of the time. Uh, the gentleman from Kansas is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I move to strike the last word. And I appreciate that uh, uh, Chairman Dingell offered this in a friendly manner with friends like that. I'm not, not sure if you need any enemies. This completely, uh, it completely guts the entire purpose of the bill, which is to get the agencies to do their task. Uh, it offers instead a report by the GAO, but of course in February of this year, uh, the GAO issued a report detailing what it called a complex natural gas pipeline permitting process. So uh, the work's been done, the, the facts have been gathered. We heard from, we heard testimony yesterday from uh, folks in the industry who talked about the challenges they've had in getting permits completed in a timely fashion. Uh, we heard from Commissioner Moeller who, while he had some concerns about the start point, um, repeatedly said that the agencies could accomplish their tasks in the statutory timeline that would be set out by H.R. 1900. He had, he had no concerns about FERC's capacity to complete that mission and that this could be done in that timeline, assuming we got uh, the timeline set at a point when applications were actually complete. Uh, there's been repeated reference, and Chairman Whitfield talked about this, to the 90 percent number that's been thrown around, that 90 percent of the permits are being undone on time. That's a very misleading uh, data set. It's, it's counterfactual to the reality on the ground. FERC does that, FERC's in control of its own certificate process, but they're completely at the emergency, uh, or mercy rather, of all the other agencies uh, that we've talked about uh, this morning who have input and are required to participate in a pipeline permitting process, an interstate natural gas pipeline permitting process. All this legislation does is bring accountability to those agencies. Uh, folks have suggested that this changes environmental law in a material way. It makes no such changes. There's not a single statutory change to any environmental law. It simply says to the agencies, you have a statute, you have a requirement, do that. Do your work. Do it in a timely fashion. Complete it against a deadline. Uh, uh, we all have deadlines in life we have to meet, uh, and that doesn't seem like an unreasonable task. And for that reason, uh, I oppose the Dingle Amendment. I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I support <clears throat> the Ningo Amendment. It focuses on core problem uh, with this legislation. The bill aims to solve a problem that may not even exist. GAO found that the uh, that first pipelines permitting is predictable, it is consistent, and it gets pipelines built. The pipeline companies agree with FERC's position. When the CEO of Dominion Energy testified on behalf of the pipeline companies back in May, he told this subcommittee that the permit permitting process is working quite well. He told us, and I quote, 
The industry can add new pipeline capacity in a timely, market responsible, responsive manner, end of quote. He also told us, and I quote again, the interstate natural gas pipeline sector enjoys a favorable legal and regulatory framework for the approval of new infrastructure, end of quote. His conclusion was that, another quote, the natural gas model works, end of quote. That was what the Natural Gas Pipeline Trade Association told us just two months ago. Yesterday, they testified, another quote, that the process is generally very good, end of quote. Nevertheless, H.R. 1900 would carelessly change this functioning permitting process by arbitrarily limiting the time that FERC and other agencies have to review pipeline applications. Under this bill, permits will automatically go into effect if deadlines were missed. Mr. Chairman, we need to go back to the drawing board on this bill. And that's what Mr. Dingle's amendment does. It replaces the bill's problematic provisions with a directive to GAO to examine the permitting process with a specific focus on delays. GAO will determine if there are problems with delays and identify potential solutions to any such problems. We should get to the facts, Mr. Chairman and fully understand that the permitting process before uh, we make these changes, uh, they could have some serious unintended consequences. And Mr. Chairman, I support uh, the Dingo Amendment, and I urge uh, that this members of the subcommittee support Mr. Dingo's amendment. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Texas recognized for five minutes. I rise in opposition to the Dingle Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm glad that my friend from Kansas has already uh, learned a lesson. You don't serve in this Congress and on this committee long enough to have the committee room named after you uh, without picking up a few tricks. Be wary of friendly amendments that start with the phrase strike all after the enacting clause, which is what the Dingle Amendment does. Um, if my good friend from Michigan wants a GEO study, all we need to do is sign a letter. If he and I sign the letter and if we can get Mr. Waxman and Mr. Upton, Whitfield and Rush, I guarantee you the GAO will do this study. You don't need to pass a federal law to get the GAO to do a study. Um, the whole purpose of the Pompeo bill is that um, uh, we're discovering natural gas in all kinds of places, including up in Michigan, where the chairman lives. Uh, we're going to have to build some pipelines, and many, many of our laws are more and more being used to thwart the permitting process. That's a fact. So Mr. Pompeo may have an inelegant solution to that problem, but it is a solution. Uh, if my friends on the Democratic side don't like his solution, please put forward something other than a study uh, as an alternative. So I uh, oppose the Dingle Amendment and support the underlying Pompeo bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, for what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? To strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, to speak uh, in favor of the friendly Dingle Amendment. Uh, I agree with the Chairman Emeritus uh, that the legislative record does not support the need for the underlying bill, and I think his amendment that says go back and understand the facts before uh, we act because this is a very critical issue that we ensure 
Uh, the infrastructure is available and it's processed, permits are processed expeditiously by agencies. But listening carefully during the hearing yesterday and reviewing the facts, uh, this, uh, the underlying legislation simply goes too far. But I think it, it, the, there's a point that uh, has been made here. Uh, but first, you, when you look at the facts, with nine, over 90 percent of pipelines uh, being permitted within uh, a year, uh, there you say, okay, well, what's happening with the other 10 percent? Those are likely very complex uh, pipeline projects, great in length, with uh, certain environmental and public health issues. So how do we, how do we uh, assist in, in the give and take in the permit process that's necessary for, for uh, expansion of infrastructure? And really by this, the underlying bill saying that this has to be established in 90 days simply is not realistic. Uh, and I think what the bill will do, it will delay these complex uh, infrastructure projects, these complex pipelines. You're going to take away any incentive for the natural give and take that happens during uh, permitting when you have agency input and, and public input uh, for pipeline companies to, to consider alternatives to the route that will help uh, move the project along. Uh, I think uh, the bill also provides for licenses, permits, and approvals to automatically go into effect if an agency does not approve or deny them by the deadline established in the bill. And that's not acceptable. That it's unclear how a license or permit that would need to include terms of conditions written by an agency could simply go into effect. This is going to cause greater delays, too, because you uh, you, you could see permits being granted that are inconsistent with other federal statutes leading to uh, litigation, excessive litigation that would draw out these projects. So um, I think uh, the, Mr. Dingell's proposal is a smart one. It's consistent now with what we know, what is in the legislative record. And I think we could, uh, the committee could uh, gain additional knowledge by having the GAO give us additional facts here and, and help us with uh, incentivizing uh, pipeline projects and the expansion of needed infrastructure across the country. Now you'll back. Gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion of the Dingle Amendment? Since no one's seeking recognition, the vote will now occur on the Dingle Amendment. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the Dingle Amendment will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Aye. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it, and the Dingle Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to H.R. 1900? Seeing none, the question would now occur on forwarding H.R. 1900 to the full committee. All those in favor would signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Well, roll call vote. The gentleman from Illinois has asked for a roll call vote. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Pitts. Mr. Pitts votes aye. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess votes aye. Mr. Latta. Mr. Latta votes aye. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. McKinley. Mr. McKinley votes aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Pompeo votes aye. Mr. Kinzinger. Mr. Kinzinger votes aye. Mr. Griffith. Mr. Griffith votes aye. Mr. Barton. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Rush. Mr. Rush votes no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Engel. Mr. Engel votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Ms. Caps. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle votes no. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui votes no. Ms. Christensen. Ms. Christensen votes no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor votes no. Mr. Waxman. Chairman Whitfield. Chairman Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Aye. Mr. Scalise votes aye. Mr. Upton. Mr. Upton votes aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner votes aye. Is there anyone other else uh, 
present who has not been recorded. The clerk would uh, please uh, report the results. Mr. Chairman, on that vote, there were 17 ayes and nine nays. 17 ayes and nine ayes. The bill is re favorably reported. The chair would now call up uh, H.R. 83 and ask the clerk to report. H.R. 83, to require the Secretary of the Interior to assemble a team of technical, policy, and financial experts to address the energy needs of the insular areas of the United States and the freely associated states through the development of action plans aimed at reducing re reliance on imported fossil fuels and increasing use of indigenous clean energy resources and for other purposes. Without objection, the first reading of the bill is dispensed with and the bill will be open for amendment at any point uh, so ordered. Are there any amendments uh, to the bill? Uh, uh, Dr. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk report the amendment? Amendment to H.R. 83 offered by Mrs. Christensen of Virgin Islands. The gentlelady is uh, recognized for five minutes. Just, just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, this amendment makes a number of minor technical changes to the bill that have been worked out with, with you, Mr. Chairman, to clarify the language and avoid any unintended consequences. And again, I want to thank you for your constructive efforts on this legislation and your willingness to work with me. Um, and I yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Is there further uh, discussion on the gentlelady's amendment? There's no further discussion on the gentlelady's amendment. Uh, I will uh, ask for a vote on her amendment. Those in favor are signified by saying aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, no. In opinion, chair, the ayes have it, and the uh, amendment is adopted. Agreed to. The question now occurs on forwarding H.R. 83 to the full committee. All those in favor will as amendment, as amended. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is agreed to. Without objection, uh, staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to the legislation approved by the subcommittee today, uh, so ordered. And uh, Mr. Rush, our, our staffs are going to be getting together with your staff on your uh, First Amendment and uh, see if we can work out something on that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to it. All right. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.